Menachem Golan calls me to his office and he tells me, breaking is over. You know, <laughs> it was a one year, one and a half year excitement. People want more ninja. That's what the buyers want. But I have an idea. He tells me, it's his idea. This time we are going to make American ninja. Now this was a crazy idea on top of a crazy idea. <laughs> Not only that the ninjas are uh, good guys, now it will be in American. And, and this is really crazy idea because this ninja tradition is Japanese. It's part of the Japanese mythology. It's part of the Japanese history. Mm. And now you're telling us that an American Hollywood, American character can become a ninja. And, but it's okay. I like, I love American movies. <laughs> I like, uh, I like uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, you know, I like I like Steve McQueen. I, I like Sean Connery. That, that's what I want. So for me, it was oh yeah, let's make an American ninja. Well, great idea. One, two, three, four. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's German late night again. We are here in Germany and on my side is, as usual, my dear friend, Sydney Thompson. Hi, Sydney. How are you? Well, to be with you, Chris, I'm great today, despite just having had a COVID jab and being in bed for a few days. Yeah, I, know. I had to get myself out of that bed when I heard the guests that you have with us tonight. Wow, what an honor to, to have uh, this guest with us. Absolutely, absolutely. So he has directed 22 feature films to date, including many for the legendary Canon Film Studio. I think most notably the first two American Ninja films with Michael Dudikoff, Breaking 2, Electric Boogaloo, Delta Force 3, Cyborg, Cop, and one of my all-time favor favorites, the great Avenging Force or Night Hunter. Welcome, Mr. Sam Furstenberg. <laughs> I am happy to be here with you in, in Germany. I'm in California, but now we are talking here in Germany. Yeah, absolutely. It's a small world. Truly, truly <laughs> international, truly international. And Sam, we cannot thank you enough for taking the time out because I know a lot of the fans of this show are absolutely... Absolutely. Uh, blown away by your work and it really had such an impact on on that generation so we can't wait to dig into some questions with you if we may yeah, yeah. please do please do i'm happy fantastic to be. fantastic so um sam i have to start off because it's just so exciting to us how did you actually get into the film industry you know and where did this love of film come from oh okay where the love of film comes from, I don't know. One doesn't know because it starts a very, very early age when I was a kid. I was a kid. I grew up in Jerusalem, in Israel, mm -hmm. in, a in a neighborhood. Uh, in, and in this neighborhood where I live, which was not center of town, was a neighborhood outside, there was a theater, the neighborhood the movie theater, uh, which, by the way, is a historical theater many, many years now. 100 years in operation now. But, and, and we as kids, and I as a, as a little boy, I used to go once a week, uh, matinee, lunch, whatever it was in the afternoon, two movies, <laughs> one ticket. <laughs> and we, we spent the entire afternoon until the evening in the theater. So uh, I was drawn to this, uh, probably to this form of telling stories with visual element on a big screen, as, as, as much as I can describe it as a little boy, fascinated by the idea that the story is being told with visual, with, with picture, with the moving picture on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then, and probably that's where the affection for, now by nature, I'm probably a storyteller because I was one of those kids that come back home and tell the, tell the movie to the other kids. <laughs> And, right. and uh, we grew up on uh, a lot of uh, uh, mostly American movies, mostly of the 50s. This was in the 1950s. 
uh, mostly American movies, Western, uh, gangster movies, Tarzan's adventures, but also Italian movies of the 50s, some, some French movies. And then, so this was the beginning. Later on, I'll, I cultivated it. I, as, a, as, a, as a little boy, you don't, I didn't understand the difference between this director, that director, how movies are being made. And it's not important. It's only the fascination. But later on, I became a teenager, high school. So I started to being more interested in movies. How is it made? Uh, what are the different countries, different style, Hollywood, Italian movies, <laughs> etc. And uh, uh, and I, I was uh, I served in the Israeli military. It's a compulsive uh, uh, service, three years. So I finished 21 years old. Uh, when I finished the service in the military, I decided that's it. I know what I want to do. I want to study this subject of how I'm making movie. How do you make movies? I love American movies, so my aim was to Hollywood, <laughs> from Israel to Hollywood. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, your first film was One More Chance, right? With uh, John LaMotta and Kirstie Alley in, her, in their debut, I, I think. And it was like a social drama. And you were already working in the film industry at that time and then went back to university to continue studying film, right? Is that right? Yes, correctly. Uh, it, uh, we left our description, uh, my description, I left in 1971, I was 21 years old, I, I went to Hollywood, I'm talking, with, I'm talking with you now from Los Angeles, from Hollywood, yeah. and I went to, to film school, I graduated, BA, three years in film school, and during film school I started to work in the movies, but not, uh, not as a director, of course, but uh, I was uh, all kind of technical jobs uh, on the set, and uh, eventually I became assistant director. I made many movies. And during that time, in, while going to school, I made a few short movies. Mm -hmm. okay. Then I became, I graduated. It was uh, 1973, 74, and I, I, 74. And I was working as assistant director continuing in the industry. So I was, uh, and even then I, I directed and produced a short movie by myself, half an hour. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in 1979, I was already 29 years old. I decided I don't want to be assistant director. That's not what I wanted to be. I wanted to, to tell stories. And the one who tells stories, the director, the writer and the director. I'm not a writer. I'm good at writing. But I, 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 I knew I wanted to be a director. I went back to, to, to graduate film school, to MA in Los Angeles, Loyola Marymount University. And when I came to school, because I was 29, I was the oldest of all the students <laughs> in my <laughs> class. And I was the most experienced. I already had five years, six years, five years of working on movies. On, on some of them are big movies. Some of the movies that I worked for big movies. And, and uh, so I had the experience and I decided that while I'm in school for this next two years, two and a half years, I am going to, instead of making another short movie, to direct a full feature movie, which will be my chance to prove, like calling card, to prove that I can make a movie. And uh, together with another student, uh, David Moormark, he produced, I directed, I wrote the script, one more chance. Now, you mentioned social drama. Yeah. Now, this is the way I saw myself. I saw myself back mm -hmm. then as a director who will direct social dramas influenced by Italian neorealism, neo uh, French, Italian movies, and also American movies, like the gangster movies, the movies which are dealing with the streets and, uh, <laughs> and so on. Uh, hey, could, could, uh, of Scorsese. And that's why I saw myself. So this movie, One More Chance that I wrote, is a social drama. Prisoner comes, uh, uh, prisoner comes out of prison trying to put his life together. And in the in the social fabric of the streets of Los Angeles, and that's and that's it's, and it's that's really why the hero's a hero's journey, also, isn't it? Which it is, is a theme that, that flows through a lot of your films. But you know, so in 1983, right? That was the first production of Revenge of, of the Ninja. Is that right? And Correct. that so that was was that your first work with Canon Films? Correct. So uh, Canon Film 
the people behind Canon Film, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, they had a previous company before company before Canon Film, uh-huh. Mary Euro Picture and another company, Noah Film. They produced many, many, many movies. Uh-huh. And I was assistant director working for them. Uh-huh. I was assistant director for Menachem Golan in some of the movies that he directed, uh-huh. Diamonds, Operation Thunderbolt, and other uh, uh, movies that they produced. I was assistant director to Boaz Davidson. That one of his movies was a big hit in Germany, Lemon Pepsicle, huge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I, I, so I knew the people. Uh, uh, in, uh, when I was working in school and making the movie, it was 1980, they purchased the company Canon Film because uh-huh. they always had the dream. They, they operated from Israel and they always had this dream to go to Hollywood. They were oh. people who were nah. very ambitious people. And they wanted to go to Hollywood. Eventually, they bought this company, Canon Film, to control. It was a company in New York City. They moved it from New York to Los Angeles. And I was stuck with, the, with this movie, One More Chance. Not enough, there was not enough money. So I went to them. By then, I, you know, I knew them very well. I said, OK, gentlemen, here I have a movie. I cannot finish it. I don't have enough money. Would you put some money into this? They saw the material, and they put some money into it. And we completed the movie. It's a not, not, it was not a commercial success in mm. any way whatsoever. But we went to some festivals, the Chicago International Film Festival, Locarno Film Festival in Switzerland. Uh, we were screening in Cannes Film Festival in France. And then by then, they produced one movie, which was called, let's say it was, uh, uh, it was uh, 1982. They produced a movie which was called Enter the Ninja. With Franco Nero, with yeah, the Italian mm-hmm. uh, uh, actor Franco Nero, and the movie and the movie was a martial art movie, action martial art movie, but with a new twist, with a ninja. Nobody yeah. in the West ever saw ninja movie, as, definitely not as a he- ninja hero. Uh-huh. There were some ninjas as villains in, in other movies, in early movie, earlier than that. Movie. So it was a new new kind of movies, and the movie had a moderate success. And this is Hollywood. What do you do if you have a success? Yeah. You make a sequel immediately. You want to make a little bit yeah. money. You want to, want to make more money. So the company. So they already started to put together a, a script and show Kasugi, the Japanese martial artist that played the well, villain. That, that one, in, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. Revenge uh, of the Ninja. Yeah. The villain in uh, Enter the Ninja. They, they signed with him a contract already to play the hero in this Revenge of the Ninja. Yeah. And so there was a script, there was a, 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 a already a name, title, and, a, and a, the main actor. But and, and Menachem Golan, the head of the company that directed the first Enter the Ninja, didn't want to direct Range of the Ninja. Maybe he was too busy with the company. I don't know the reason. And he turned to me. I just finished the movie, so I proved, okay. So they said, okay, this guy, he can put the movie together. He can put the story together. Uh, he's not expensive. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <That's hiring. laughs> so, so they approach me and say, okay, we have this, uh, you saw Enter the Ninja, we have a sequel, would you do it? Yeah. And of course, me. So again, this was not my, di- my intention. I told you, I, I thought, I saw myself as a director who's directing mm. the social redeeming dramas or whatever. Uh, but uh, I'm a young director, I'm looking for a chance. What am I going to say? Then, of course I will direct it for you. No question, no problem. I will do it for you. And, and that's how and I wasn't that a great play. wasn't that a great decision looking back at what you know what followed from that? Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic decision. <coughs> <coughs> so sorry, it was a fantastic decision. I'll tell you why. Because what I discovered, I was not I, I liked action movie, you know, I, I like other boys, a teenager, I saw uh, James Bond, I was watching uh, uh, the gangster, mo- the westerns, westerns, the American yeah. westerns are full of action, mm-hmm. the way I grew up, and I say, and, and, the, and the like of James Bond, which at this time, at the, at the 70s, there were a lot of them, that's how I grew up, so I, I love action movie, I just didn't see myself as going there. But what I discover in the process of making this Revenge of the Ninja, that there are element, uh, uh, an action movie, more or less the type of action movies I directed were 
45 minutes action, 45 minutes story, dialogue. So I discovered that the 45 minutes of action is actually pure cinema. You're yeah. going back to the silent movie. You yeah. have to make, as a director, your job is to make a sequence, no words, nothing, nobody's, no explanation, only the images that you see in the screen are forming a story, just like silent cinema, silent movies. And, and it was a challenge, a cinematic, professional challenge. How do you put together something with only images on the screen? And I enjoyed it. I, I found that, that from a technical point of view, from a, a directorial, editorial, cinematography, putting together action, mm. if you do it good and exciting, like James Bond, is a great challenge, great directorial challenge. Okay. So it was a good decision in this aspect. It was also a good decision from a from the Hollywood, the way Hollywood works. The profile. At the time, I don't know if today, at the time Hollywood was divided between the major studio, the big movies, yeah. the seven studios, Universal, MGM, uh, mm -hmm. Paramount, etc., and the independent companies. And the big, the big companies, the, the studios, they made big budget movies, which to put every movie of those, just to put it together takes years. From the mm -hmm. beginning, there is so much, and in the independent, or they make much smaller budget movies, it moves fast. They decide to make a movie within three months, you're shooting already. You're it's the already Wild West, shooting. isn't it? It's the Wild West. So this, so this was one decision that led me in this path of independent quick. Yeah. So was that more exciting? I, 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 I believe so. I was not involved. It never, in, through my career, I didn't enter the world of major uh, studio movie making mm. though friends of mine did and I, I i knew and i know how it works in the independent canon was a up and coming company very successful you know in the first year they produced uh, three movies in the second year seven movies at some point they produced like 40 movies a year it was a very dynamic company mm. that was making movies and to be involved with such a company with canon film they gave me one chance after the other. So yeah. it was, yes, it was exciting. I was busy all the time making movies. And, and we had more or less free hand in the big studio. There are so many people who may, helps you to, or helps you to make decision or, or, or distract your decision or bar you from making decision. In, the, in, this, in Canon, nobody bothered me. We did whatever I wanted. <laughs> More or less. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, You're making absolutely. me jealous. You're making me jealous. <laughs> But Sam, can I ask? Can I ask you um, how were you seen at Canon Films? I mean, after the success of American Ninja, did you become kind of the studio's leading director? No, I, I cannot say leading director because what they did, what Canon did, more or less, Menachem Golan was a director himself, a storyteller. He understood, and he started to collect around him few directors, more or less, that worked with him. So there was a group of directors, which was kind of in-house director. I was one of them, same person, but Joe Zito, Toby Hooper was in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sheldon Ledditch at some point was, was a, a part of it. So there was a group, Aaron Norris later. So mm -hmm. there was this group, but on the other hand, they also have directors who made the other type of movie like Andrei Kanchalovsky. Okay. They played the like, uh, runaway train. Runaway train, kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Different kind of movies. But just to answer the question, whenever they had some troubles and they wanted to do a sequel, or something, they turned to me. Breaking to Electric Boogaloo, Sam Frostenberg. American <laughs> Ninja number two, Sam <laughs> so, so yes and no, but no, not the leading. I cannot say that. It, so it, not the leading. but The lead guy was so Menachem Golan. Menachem Golan was the king of Canon film. <laughs> So not the leading, but definitely the go-to problem fixer. Mm. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But as, as I mentioned, they made so many movies that they yeah. needed more director just than one. They made so many movies. And the name Albert Payun made many movies mm. for them. Uh, you know, uh, the low budget, the low budget genre directors of the time, of the 80s, almost everybody worked for Kenan. Yeah. So, um, Speaking of, you know, just the, the films that really impacted in the 80s, yeah. you know, also from low budget. And <laughs> we here in Europe, at least, 
American Ninja was literally a game changer. I don't know if you know the impact yeah. it had. Absolutely, um, absolutely. 1985. Um, could, could you possibly just tell us a little bit about the making of that film? I will tell you, I, I, I'm aware of it, I know, and, and not only, it, it's, it's a global wide, worldwide, absolutely, American, absolutely. impact of American Ninja. And I will try to explain why, now that I'm older and wiser, I can look in a retrospective. Canon Film made this uh, decision to make the ninja movies. Within the, there were a lot of martial art movies in the 80s, but they all came from Hong Kong from China. Yeah. China used to do what we used to call karate movies, mm. uh, kung fu movies, mm. you remember. But those were very Chinese, especially for a martial art audience, people who are interested. Now, there are some movies made also in America, uh, Octagon with Chuck Norris, uh, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee. So there are a few martial art movies made in America, in Hollywood, in the independent uh, uh, world, the two big names, as I said, Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee were the two big names, but nobody, but, and there are many types of uh, martial arts, the Chinese, Brazilian, uh, China, the Japanese. The ninja phenomena belongs to Chinese, to Japanese culture only. You know, there were the, within the world of martial art, of the shoguns and the samurais, they were the bad guys because samurais, they were like knights. They never did anything bad. Supposedly, only good, uh, you know, uh, fair fights. So when the shogun needed some uh, dirty word work, they turned to the ninjas. So ninjas appeared in in movies mm -hmm. uh, in the eighties or seventies, mainly in Japanese movies. Sometimes in the Hong Kong movies, but always, to the best of my knowledge, always the bad guys, always as the antagonists or some kind of. Uh, uh, bad uh, people in the shadows that are harming. Now came Canon with Menachem Golan, and the idea came from Mike Stone. Mike Stone is also a famous martial artist in, in American uh, martial <coughs> art history. It was his idea. He came to Canon, and they decided to turn it around to make a movie about uh, uh, Ninja, but the Ninja is also the protagonist and the antagonist. They are, all the characters are Ninjas, that's it. And they will include martial art fight, but also regular action. So we landed after uh, Enter the Ninja. They gave me the chance to do Revenge of the Ninja and another one, Ninja 3, The Domination, because they were selling good. They sell those movies very well. And uh, and this, this was this whole crazy idea that suddenly the ninjas are good. They can be good guys. After Revenge of the Ninja, and we did Avenging Force, which was not uh, the poster behind you, which was not a martial art movie. And then I was given the chance to direct a musical, uh, Breaking Two Electric Boogaloo. Menachem Golan calls me to his office and he tells me, Breaking is over. You know, <laughs> it was a one year, one and a half year excitement. <laughs> People want more Ninja. That's what the buyers want. But I have an idea. He tells me, it's his idea. This time we are going to make American Ninja. Now this was a crazy idea on top of a crazy idea. <laughs> Not only that the ninjas are uh, good guys, now it will be an American. And, and this is really crazy idea because this ninja tradition is Japanese. It's part of the Japanese mythology. It's part of the Japanese history. Mm. And now you're telling us that an American Hollywood American character can become a ninja. And, but it's okay. I like, I love American movies. I like, uh, I like uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, you know, I like, I like Steve McQueen. I, I like Sean Connery. That, that's what I want. So for me, it was, oh yeah, let's make an American Ninja. Well, great idea. I said, I, I told Menachem Golak. We wrote a script with the writer, Paul DeMilke. And, and we created a really, uh, uh, a Hollywood American character, Joe Armstrong. We gave him some uh, Oriental background, some background he, because he, when he had a little boy, he, but this is only an excuse to, to transition from, from Japan to America, to, mm. to make this transition. And, and the movie, when we made the movie, 
we kind of felt that, the, oh, and we chose Michael Dudikoff, the actor to be, uh, and that's important in Hollywood movies, the actor, the, the star is very important, very, very important, whoever is the star of the movie. And he was right. He was the right yeah. character, the right guy for American Ninja. He, all, he possessed all the necessary characteristics. And the movie was finished. We, there was a feeling that it's a good, interesting movie, good movie with a potential. At the same, when we finished the editing, Menachem Golan approached me with another script, which was called Night Hunter, which became a... Avenging Force. Became yeah. Avenging Force. And this was, I didn't know at the time, it was a script for Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris rejected it. So mm. Golan asked me... It was a sequel, a sequel to Invasion USA, right? Exactly. Yeah. It was a sequel yeah. to Invasion USA. Yeah. It was written by a British uh, writer, James, Bo James Booth. Mm actor or writer and and uh, he asked me do you think it will fit uh, michael dudikov and steve james that, that, because by then we saw that there is a good chemistry we saw on the screen the movie did not come out american fighter american ninja did not come out yet but we we felt we sensed that there is good chemistry between michael and steve james michael dudikov and steve james and he asked me i read the script uh, um, i read the script was fantastic. I love the script, Night Hunter, Avenging Force. And so they say, okay, go to New Orleans. It, the story takes place in New Orleans. So they say, okay, go to New Orleans and make the movie. Meantime, they prepared to distribute American Ninja. American Ninja was actually distributed by MGM, not by Canon. MGM already, they liked uh, uh, Revenge of the Ninja. They distributed the Breaking to Electric Boogaloo. So they took also this one. While we are shooting the movie, in, uh, filming the movie in New Orleans, the American Ninja came out in theater, in the uh, video store, VHS, depends in different type places in the world, almost simultaneously, all around the world. And then we started to hear, in New, in New Orleans, we started to hear the impact of this American Ninja. <laughs> now, what happened, back to your question, so, and, and we are busy there, and then we realize what's happening. Mm -hmm. the company, ourselves, myself, Michael Dudikov, Steve James, But what happened, we hit the right spot all over the world, especially in the 80s. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that today is correct, <laughs> correct with the superhero. The language of the general action genre is American, is Hollywood. Mm. Today we see good, good Chinese action movies. But, but at the time, this was it. A good action movie will come only from Hollywood. And what comes from Hollywood is... Caucasian, white heroes, American, so-called American. Uh, you know, Stallone was at the time a big action hero. Uh, Schwarzenegger was a big... And the likes. This was the like. Those are the people who can save the world. The type, the stereotype, mm -hmm. the archetype that can save yeah. them. And here comes Amer uh, Michael Dudikov, American Ninja. So he's not Shokasugi that came from Japan to America. He is genuine Hollywood, stereotypical. Uh, mm. And that's why, and it's all over the world. So it's, it's, it's correct for Africa, it's correct for Indonesia, and it's correct for Brazil. That's the type of movies that this audience, young male audience w watched, and boom, suddenly they can identify with what they know as the Hollywood type. Mm. And that's that's why probably the impact. It's, I say probably because it's very very hard to to tell why a movie is success or not. Yeah. But that's a magical there are so formula. Many <clears throat> that's a magical secretive. formula. The, the formula. There is no formula. If there was a formula, all of us would have been millionaires. You know. Yeah. <laughs> but there is no formula. But that's probably that's why I said probably why it was such a success in Europe and all all other countries around the world, except one country. It was not successful in Japan. <laughs> for, yeah. for obvious reasons. <laughs> and, and you... Maybe today, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. open to it. Yeah, today, nowadays, it, there is a comeback also in Japan, but, but at the time, 85, the movie came out in 1985. In Japan, it was, it didn't work out. They were mm. not amused. Yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, um, Canon told you to do the sequel immediately, right? Immediately. Do... So, yeah. so as I told you, we, we were in New Orleans shooting Avenging Force. 
Yeah. And, and the movie came out, big success. We finished the filming of Avenging Force. The material came back to, to Los Angeles for editing. We are editing. And while I'm busy with the editor editing, they already approach me and say, we must have American Ninja number two. The audience all over the world, they demanded, they, that's what they wanted. Of course, the buyers, it's, it's yeah. money, it's Hollywood. It's a, it's a, in Hollywood, it's an industry. This is not an art, not for art's sake. The movies we are making are not for art sake, are for, for commercial <laughs> success. So uh, they already hooked me up with the writer and we were already, while I was uh, busy editing Avenging Force, at the same time I was busy writing with the writer, I'm not writing, uh, American Ninja. The day we put the music together, the day I saw the music put to Avenging Force, the next day I was on an airplane to South Africa. Uh, Avenging, uh, American Ninja Number no. Two was was filmed in South Africa. Mm -hmm. how, how how do you look at the sequel? Do you like the sequel? I mean, do you what do you think about the sequel? Is it? I don't. I listen. Yeah. It's, this is my what I am expressing now is my uh, opinion as a viewer, not okay. as a director. Okay. Okay. Nowadays, where American Ninja is very popular. Yeah. Considerably, you know, I, I, it's not gone with the wind, but it's popular. <laughs> so there are, I, I get a lot of reaction and I, you know, there are web pages in the internet and Facebook yeah. and social media and people. So there are many people who, who write American Ninja number two is much better than American Ninja number one. And then there are the opponent people say, are you crazy? American Ninja <laughs> number one is much better than American yeah. Ninja number two. So there is <laughs> split opinion. I am with number one. Okay. I believe that the first American Ninja was uh, was a genuine, interesting uh, uh, subject matter, and 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 the, the the formula that we took right from the beginning was the reluctant hero. It, it's a western. It's a standard. Uh, mm. It's a western drama. The reluctant hero who does not want to get involved in any trouble, but the circumstances of life. I mean, this is a standard uh, Greek drama, if you want. <laughs> the circumstances of life are pushing him, and because of the values, his his inner values, his uh, moral value, he has no choice but to get involved. So this mm. is the movie High Noon with Gregory Peck. He, oh. he didn't. The sheriff doesn't want to get involved, but the circumstances are pushing him to a point that he cannot uh, be neutral anymore. The he trouble pains at him. So that's why I like it very much. The other thing that I like, there was a, uh, the, the other thing that I like about American Ninja, there, there was an innocent love story, beautiful, innocent love story, Michael Dudikoff and Judy Aronson. And, and, and the chemistry of this little story, side story, the love story, the romantic story, no sex, you don't show any sex, nothing, but there was a good feeling about it. And the, the two friends' relationship, the Meltas, the Meltas Falcon situation. Two friends who are, they yeah. meet uh, during the story, during the drama, and it, it's, they bond and to the point that they are willing to give each other's life to save the other. So all of those are basic elements of drama or Hollywood movies that go on, and they just work and it's innocent. Uh, what we did in American Ninja number two, which, which is really different, that the two heroes, <laughs> Steve James and Michael Ludikov, they have a purpose right from the beginning. They have a mission. They are not drawn into action the way I That's like true. Yeah. reluctant hero. Yeah. They are just, they come in with a mission to do something and to achieve, which is less dramatic in my opinion. Was But, it less dramatic or less of a creative process for you to make? Because when probably. I hear you talk about the first one, I hear the innocence, the fresh perspective, that fresh creativity in you when you're talking about it. Maybe. <laughs> you might be right. You might be right. It was fresh idea for me. Fresh. Yeah, you might be right. But the second movie has a different atmosphere. It's a very light atmosphere, yeah. uh, like celebration of, uh, you know, this whole island, the tropical island feeling and, and more jokes and more making fun of the, you know, making fun of this uh, ridiculous idea of ninjas fighting in the middle of the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, 
So uh, we took it more seriously uh, in the first American Ninja. Was a little bit darker. The fights during during the night usually <laughs> more more dramatic, and that, and it it almost sounds like that specific time where you were doing that work. It had, even though you were following a lot of things that had already been done in the past, what you were created hadn't actually been done before, and. And that's so so exciting and when you compare that with like today's Hollywood today's film industry that's night and day I mean could you maybe just talk on how you feel about um the film industry today what what things you feel have changed for the better what for the worse I mean it'd be great to, to just get your view on that so so I will so if we go this was the time the 80s when we were when we were moving if we go a little bit to the past, when I was a boy, there was Tarzan. Tarzan was the ninja of my, my childhood. You know, they created all kinds of Tarzan sequels, one after yeah. the other, Johnny Weissmiller. And, and, uh, but they were primitive. Primi when you see them today, primitive movies. In the 80s, there was a time, there was money. Money was coming from the video cell. The, the VHS, the video, the home entertainment was beginning and booming. You mm -hmm. guys remember all over the world there was uh, maybe you don't remember <laughs> there was a, a, a rental shop in every corner of every neighborhood. Yeah, of course, of course. Darling, rental... darling, I'm almost fifty. I remember. Yeah, that poster is from a rental store. I'm walking to the video <laughs> shop. <laughs> so this this new industry, not an industry, this new outlet brought in a lot of resources, a lot of money. Yeah. That the big studios did not pay attention. So all these small companies, Canon, uh, Corelco, PM Entertainment, there were many companies like Canon. Canon was the biggest. They, they used this money to make much better action movies than Tarzan's, let's say, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, not as good as James Bond. We didn't have this kind of money, but we had enough money. There was plenty of money and we make much better movies than in the 60s, action independent movies. They look good. They look uh, uh, rich with the, we had enough, enough resources. What we did, what we didn't have at the time, we didn't have enough money, let's say, and the, it was not developed enough, the optical special effects. Mm -hmm. In the 80s were not developed enough. So yes, uh, you know, Cameron did the Terminator, but it was very sophisticated and expensive in the 80s to deal with the, either with models, with the, stop action movement or with the... so we were limited to do physical action and mm. for some reason this was what was going on if we, either it was stallone or schwarzenegger or jean claude van damme or michael dudikoff the action was physical whatever you saw on the yeah. screen we really executed on the set of course, we use doubles, and of course, we use uh, precaution not to not to kill our actors and <laughs> they are not wounded. But and so there were body double and uh, special stunt uh, people. But the action was physical. You really saw the action. Then a new generation of viewer came up. Ninth, the end of the nineties. We we operated until the middle of the nineties. This was the end of our industry, of the, the movies we are talking about, the low budget, uh, independent genre film, horror pictures and, uh, and action and some sci-fi. And uh, then the studios entered this field and they took it over from, so they started with Predators and True Lies. They mm -hmm. made the same movies, but with much, much bigger, bigger uh, Budgets, budget. Yeah. They took in Schwarzenegger, the they, took yeah. Stallone, they took Van Damme, Universal took Van Damme. So they moved to another level with more money, but the same kind of movies. As I say, Predator, True Lies, yeah, just to accept. True, absolutely, yeah. But then a new audience uh, came to the stage, and those are kids who grew up with video games. When we were making mm. movies in the 80s, they played video games. And in the 90s, they played video games. So now they perceived action in much faster uh, pace and in a much more... Uh, 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 not only dynamic, but fantasy world. Yeah. Because in the video games, as you know, everything goes. Mm -hmm. uh, every, every fantastic idea goes. And out of this, as a response, the new movies of the superheroes started to emerge. And those movies and, and other action, 
The Fast and the Furious, for example. In those movies, they are using a lot of optical effect, yeah. which enable them to do action sequences which are so fantastic that are beyond, they are not reality anymore. Yes, if you have a car flying from one top of one building to the other building and landing and continuing, this is not doable. It's not the reality. A car cannot fly from one building to another. Uh, you know, Spider-Man cannot circle the Empire State Building. But oh, gosh, don't it's... tell my son that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. It's beautiful. Absolutely. It's much bigger. But as a director, as a you have to producer, you have to rely a lot of special optical special effects. Sure, yeah. Blue screen, what they call them, blue screen, cables, hoisting, and you are using the actor, your real actor, the real star, you're using him less and less and less and less, and most of the action is executed by doubles, and here and there you get a, a close-up of your hero, maybe except uh, maybe Tom Cruise that the rumors is that he's doing everything himself <laughs> in Mission Impossible, or most of the stuff himself, but most of the action today, you know, the stars, the, the real actors are not doing it. There is a second unit with all doubles and they go and they do it. And then months and months and months of working with the special effect department and uh, optical effect. So, so what, we, what we gain is fantastic action, beautiful, mind blowing action, which fits the, the audience that grew up on the video games. What we lost is the immediacy of the action, the feeling, this, this hidden mm. feeling behind. As, when you see it as an audience, you don't have to understand the technical. You're an audience. You don't have to be a movie expert. But there is a, a subconscious feeling. There is a feeling in the background that you see that the movies of the 80s are greedy. Are You know, when, when somebody falls to the ground, really falls to the ground. <laughs> When a motorcycle goes over a wall, we really had a motorcycle going over the wall. It was not a fact. There was nothing. Yeah. So there is a feeling. And that's the reason for the resurrection of those movies of the 80s. They are now coming back. Mm -hmm. First of all, for nostalgic reason, some people from, those old, from the 80s, when they were young kids in the 80s, and they see the movies today, they kind of, they, they, they miss uh, yeah, uh, like me. <laughs> want to, to see me. This, uh, action. You are one of them. They want to see the action, the greedy action. So yeah. they go and they watch it again. There is a richer, and there is a young generation who discover, rediscover, yeah. discover, rediscover this feeling. And 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 uh, I know that those movies are being a lot discussed. Not only the movies of Sam Fersberg, but I say Sheldon Ledig, uh, Albert Payun, Joe Zito. The, all of the, all those directors, all the, those movies are coming back. They are being screened in festivals. They are being screened. There are a lot of uh, fans and uh, people are talking about it. And I, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll finish to answer your question by telling you an episode. I was invited just before the pandemic, two years ago, January, two years ago. <laughs> I was invited to a screening downtown. There is a club, film club, and they, uh, they show only print, 35 millimeter prints. They don't screen from videos. This is part of the rules of the club. And they had a screening of Ninja 3, The Domination. And they invited me to introduce Q&A, questions, and then yeah. I came over there. First of all, the theater was full. And people came with costumes. Yeah, people, <laughs> they came with Ninja costumes to the screening. <laughs> and, and with posters for me of to course, sign. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was, and and they know this. The, they know the movie line by line. You know they are reciting the lines. Yeah. <laughs> so, so which means that there are big army of fans for those movies all over the world. It's true. Yeah. And and uh, you guys know I uh, from Germany. Marco Sidelman from Germany just uh, uh, wrote this book. Ah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. which deals with the movies of uh, Sam Persson, yeah. but not only. Also the, the independent <laughs> genre movies of the. Of the eighties, and there are other, and there are a lot of books about canon and, and more yeah. books about uh, more discussion and more. So this is the comparison. This is my feeling uh, regarding the new modern 
action movie scene. It is also if 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 the audience wants to know more about Canon Films, there's also this uh, documentary. You are in that, right? You are in that. Right, I am yeah. in it. Yeah, this is yeah. a great documentary. About yeah, absolutely, Electric Boogaloo. That's really really interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. The history so, of Canon film. So, Sam, you know there are at least yeah. there is at least four documentaries about Canon. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Canon was quite a, quite a thing. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, kind of the, the era, an era. Yeah, the movies that made us kind of you know we grew up with that and so Sam, my last question would be when you look back today, which film are you most proud of, or which film of your films means the most to you? Okay, I, I, it's a, a conflicting feeling, I'll tell you. Yeah. From all the action movies that I directed, my feeling is that Avenging Four is the best. Avenging yeah, absolutely. Avenging Four is the best movie from a cinema point of view. Yeah. From a script, drama, it, it is a social drama. It deals yeah. with social subject of uh, uh, white supremacy, whatever you want. Yeah. The movie today is more relevant than when we made it 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And, and the action is well executed, good action, good story. As I mentioned, James Booth wrote it. I had some good actors in it. Uh, John P. Ryan was the villain, excellent actor. And all in all, it's a good, solid movie that at the level of the top movies, like if, if it was a studio movie, it would have been. Absolutely. The other thing, I made a movie which is called Riverbend. It's mm -hmm. a racial, and I told you just, I just saw a documentary yesterday, somebody made a documentary about it. Uh, uh, racial tension in the South, in, in, in Mississippi in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Very interesting movie, was not successful, was not popular for many various reasons we don't have to deal with now. That's also with uh, Steve James, right? Also Steve James yeah, is there, yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. And Margaret Avery, Mm -hmm. and some great actors from Texas. It was done in Texas. So, um, and I, I like very much Breaking to Electric Boogaloo because A, it's a musical, no violence, no, no blood, nobody's getting hurt. Also social, uh, you know, in, in a very cliche way, it's a social redeeming story about neighborhood fighting the city hall and winning. And so the neighborhood is, The, the power of the people works here within within envelope of dancing and singing and playing. So it's a it's a clear, but I like it very much. But saying all of this, I cannot deny that the most popular movie I ever directed is American Ninja. Mm. So so the audience <laughs> is the judge, you know. I, I can tell you whatever I want. I like this, I like that. But the mm. final judge, the real judge is the audience. And American Ninja is phenomenal. 35 years, 37 years, and it's so popular. It's still watched by, it's it's, it's a being played in all the streaming services, uh, mm -hmm. cable, uh, cassette. It, it comes out again and again in the Blu-ray, came out now in Blu-ray with commentary. Yeah, uh, It has a life, uh, eternal Absolutely. life. It's one of those movies that is not going to disappear. It's going to stay there for another 35 years. I'm sure mm. because people identify with it. The actors are attractive <laughs> and charismatic. The story is in this, as well, I mentioned already the element. I don't want to repeat it. And it's a popular, popular movie that was not affected by time. Mm. Sam, can I, can I just tell you something? It's a bit of a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this, Chris. Yeah, great. Chris said, Oh my God, I'm so, I'm so, you know, excited that yeah. Sam Furstenberg on and, and, you know, on top of that, he's such a great guy. And I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Good so story. Sam, Sam, your work impacted a whole generation, in, you know, like you said, you know, 30 odd years ago, but your energy today is just as impactful. You are a breath of fresh air and you're lucky I'm married already because I think I just fell a little bit in love with you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the compliment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, listen, I, you know, we are, in this world, we all, we all have purpose. One, one, 
becomes a doctor because that's his purpose to heal people and another one becomes a baker that's his purpose to make bread for the people and they are the storyteller us we tell stories and and if we are good at it we can tell stories in a movie or just verbally so yeah I, I'm a storyteller <laughs> enthusiastic <laughs> and excited storyteller uh, whether it's a, either, either the, the drama or the story behind the drama mm. <laughs> I like mm-hmm. to tell them Yeah, that's Thank you very much. Thank actually you. a nice ending for the interview. We are coming to an end. It was very, very interesting talking to you and a great, great honor to meet you. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah? Thank for, you. It, it was fantastic. And uh, I hope all of your viewers and listeners will enjoy it. Good. Sam, Dan. <laughs> Sydney. Bye-bye. See you to meet next everybody. time. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Great. Have Thank a great you. day. Bye-bye, Sam. Bye-bye.